السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا أرحم الراحمين جزاك الله خير We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to help us uh, learn the things that are uh, aid to us in our life from our religion and to increase our knowledge in our religion and to help us finish our study of the seerah, the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to get the benefit of the lessons that, uh, the, the, that shines through the, the history of the early Islam. And uh, I would like to apologize to you about missing last uh, session and inshallah we'll uh, pick up where uh, brother Jamil, may Allah reward him, left us and that is after finishing the uh, Umrat al-Qada which is the Umrah, the visit that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made to Mecca uh, based on the conditions of al-Hudaybiyah treaty of Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. We are now in the eighth year after Hijrah, and according to most historians, uh, we are in the month of Jamad al-Ula, which coincides with the months of either August or September of the uh, year 629. And what happened at that time is the Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent a, a messenger, sent a messenger called Al Harith ibn Amr ibn Umayr al Uzdi. This Al-Harith was a messenger, an ambassador of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to uh, a king uh, up north in Syria, in Asham. And that king was over a town called Busra, which is still over there now. And uh, on the road there, there was a big tribe uh, of al ghassasina the people of Ghassan. These people were Christian and they were allies to the Roman Empire. They were allied with the Byzantine Romans. And the king of that uh, tribe, which uh, they had towns and smaller towns, and, and we will go into that, inshallah, over in more details. The man, the king was Shurahbil ibn Amr from Ghassan. This man was, uh, as we said, a, a follower of Caesar, of the Byzantine Empire, and he arrested the, the, the messenger. He arrested the ambassador of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is against the known international laws and against tradition and customs even in those days. As you do not, here we, we have a saying, don't kill the messenger, don't punish the messenger. He was the messenger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a message to the king of Busra. And this man, this king, Shurahbil, arrested the, the ambassador and then he killed him. He killed the messenger for no other reason other than he was carrying a message to to the king of Busra uh, inviting him to Islam and that offended the king of Ghassasina Shurahbi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, angry and upset and the entire reputation and the entire uh, dignity of the Muslim community, the Muslim ummah at that time now in jeopardy and he had to retaliate. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had to teach Shurahbil, that man, a lesson. That if you break the known laws, if you break the tradition, if you commit a crime against Muslims, then Muslims will retaliate. The Muslims will answer back. And what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, he prepared an army of 3,000 fighters, which is at that point the biggest army that ever gathered for Muslims. And he asked for that army to move on and be ready to move to uh, punish Shurahbil and his tribe for the crime they committed against the ambassador. And the only army that was about that size was never outside Medina. If you remember in the Battle of the Trench in uh, Al Ahzab, they had 3,000 fighters, but that was all they had, and they were all in Medina. But the army that moves outside Medina, then that was 3,000 armies. And then Rasulullah himself did not go out with the army. He treated that army as Sariya, and not Ghazwa. 
uh, you will see that in, in many books this is called Sariyat Mu'ta and in some books it's called Ghazwat Mu'ta this is the only battle the only place that, that it's, it's called Ghazwa where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't there it's because it was so big it was a huge army and the events that followed they, some historians call it as Ghazwa but if you go back to the actual academic study of Sira this is not called Ghazwa because Ghazwa by definition is the army or Ba'ath that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually was in and in this one he was not Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam However, the commander that he uh, uh, gave the command over this army was Zayd ibn Harith. Now Zayd used to be the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the one that was married to Zainab bin Jahsh, and then he's the one that is mentioned in the Quran after uh, he, was, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give the divorce from Zainab. And he was called the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his title among the companions was Hibbu Rasulillah. He was the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was so beloved to his heart, like his, really his own son in a way, but there is no adoption in Islam. And then said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is the commander, and if he gets killed, if he gets killed, then the command go to Ja'far. Now Ja'far is Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. He's the son of Abu Talib. He is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if Ja'far was killed, then the command go or the banner go to Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is the poet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one that was with him on the Amrit al-Qaba and he was say, he's chanting with the poetry against the non-believers of Mecca. And he was also one of the beloved Sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he gave the banner to Zayd and asked him to go on and revenge the crime that was committed against Al-Harith ibn Umayr. And then this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded his army. He said, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اغزوا بسم الله في سبيل الله من كفر بالله Invade in the name of Allah, in the name of Allah, the, in the way of Allah, those who rejected Allah. لا تغدروا ولا تغيروا Do not betray. Do not stab anybody in the back. ولا تقتلوا وليدا ولا امرأة Do not kill a child or a woman. وَلَا كَبِيرًا ثَانِيًا And not an older man. So he prevented them from killing smaller children, he prevented them from killing women, and he prevented them from killing older people. وَلَا مُنْعَزِلًا بِصَوْمًا And not a worshipper in a place of worship. For those who want to know the real manners and the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, they're going into a Christian land. They're going to invade a Christian tribe. And he said, if you saw somebody like a monk, uh, a minister, somebody who is worshipping, has isolated himself in, in, a, in a monastery, you do not attack him, you do not bother them. وَلَا تَقْطَعُوا نَخْلًا وَلَا شَجَرًا Do not cut a tree, and do not cut a palm tree. وَلَا تَهْدِمُوا بِنَانًا And do not ruin a house. Do not ter- ruin a house. And then people started getting... Uh, ready to move on and the army of Mu'ta started to go on and, and be ready and then one of the commanders the three commanders that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam appointed we know the first one is Zayd ibn Haritha the second one is Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and the third one is Abdullah ibn Abi Rawaha now the third commander Abdullah ibn Abi Rawaha was seen and with tears in his eye he was seen crying and people gathered around him, and you know, he was a brave man, and he was a solid man, and he, it's not one of his habits to cry. And then they said, what are you crying over, Abdullah? What are you crying over? And then he said, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ مَا بِيَ مِنْ حُبِّ الدُّنْيَا شَيْءٍ It's not that I love life that I'm crying about. And there is a hidden message in there that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people got a hint that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, if somebody is there, dies, then give it to the other person, and then if that person dies, give it to that third person, there is some kind of a prophecy 
a hidden prophecy that actually that will happen. That actually Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would not say that had he not had the inspiration that that's going to happen. So those commanders in their own mind, they were getting ready for a certain death. They were getting ready to die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, appointed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when they saw Abdullah crying, they thought he was shaken by that hidden prophecy, and he was hesitating to go on, or he was sad that he's going to leave his town, he's going to leave his family, he's going to leave his children, he's going to leave his wife, and go and die. And then he said, Wallahi ma biya min hubbi dunya. Wallahi, it is not for the love of, love of life that I am crying. Wala sababatan bikum. And not for the love of you. Not because I, I, will, I, will, I don't want to uh, leave you, miss you. وَلَكِنِّي سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ يَقْرَأُ آيَةِ صلى الله عليه وسلم But I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم reciting a verse of the Qur'an and that verse says وَإِن مِنْكُمْ And this is in, in Maryam verse 70, 71 He said He said وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَى رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًّا All of you meaning the verse the translation of the verse in loosely that all of you, all of you, every one of you will come towards the hellfire. And that is a certainty from God. And the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used is wariduha. And wariduha al-wurud, this verb, basically describes people that go to well to drink from that well. So the wurud is going to the well or to the water, and as-sudur, is coming back from the water. And these two verbs in Arabic are used for that particular uh, meaning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that specific word to describe how people will pass by and go towards hell. billah. And then he said, Abdullah as he was crying, فَلَسْتُ أَدْرِي كَيْفَ لِي بِالصَّدْرِ بَعْدَ الْوُرُودِ I don't know how we'll come, I will come back. I don't know whether I will actually go into hell fire and be tormented in the hellfire, or I'll just pass by the hellfire, and be of those who survive the torment of Jahannam. And then the Muslims uh, sympathized and cried with them, and they said, صَحِبَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِالسَّلَامَةِ وَدَفَعَ عَنْكُمْ وَرَدَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا صَالِحِينَ They started praying for him, they said, may, may Allah be with you, may Allah make you safe, may Allah bring you back to us victorious and, and, and uh, safe. And then he said, he uh, recited a poet, which was one uh, of the last uh, two poetries that Abdullah ibn Rawaha had. He said, I do not ask safety, and then the, the, the poetry. I'm going to recite it, in, I'm going to say it in Arabic, and then, and then go over the translation. He said, as they were uh, asking for his safety, he said, لَكِنَّنِي أَسْأَلُ الرَّحْمَانَ مَغْفِرَةً وَضَرْبَةً ذَاتَ فَرْغٍ تَقْذِفُ الزَّبَدًا أو طعنة بيدي حران مجهزة بحربة تنفذ الأحشاء والكبد حتى يقال إذا مروا على جثدي أرشده الله من غاز وقد رشد The poetry goes I do not ask for safety I ask for forgiveness from Allah If you want to ask for something for me ask for me that Allah will forgive my sins And I ask Allah to give me martyrdom I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me a stab in my belly that, that will rip apart my liver and will spill my insides out. So when people drop and walk by my body, they will look at it and they say, may Allah forgive him that he was a good soldier in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was victorious and he got his martyrdom and may Allah accept him as a martyr. This is loosely the translation of the poetry that he recited as he walked out of Medina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walked with the army and he was giving them the recommendations what to do, what not to do, how they not, shouldn't be killing this and doing that, how to fight and how to step fast in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he reached to the north of Medina there is a place, co- place called Thaniyat al-Wada' the Thaniyat al-Wada' which is this, which is it's recited in the, in the famous also chanting Tala' al-Badru alayna min Thaniyat al-Wada' etc that place that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached and he gave a farewell to the army Muslim army kept on moving north until they got to a place in Jordan today called Ma'an, which is south of the capital Amman. 
Ma'an, which is the, was one of the closest cities in the north of Hijaz, in the north of Arabia, and this is in south, mid-south of Jordan. And then the intelligence, the scouts that they send out to gather the information for them on the way, that they were heading towards who? They're heading to punish Shurahbil, Al-Ghassani. The intelligence came back as he said, it's not Shurahbil that is waiting for you, it is Herakl. It's Heraclius, it's the emperor, it's the Caesar himself. And he has brought 100,000 soldiers of Byzantium, of Byzantine Rome. He brought 100,000 soldiers to face those 3,000. 3, and then from the tribes of Ghassan and the Christian tribes of Northern Arabia, they gathered another 100,000 soldiers. So intelligence came to these, to, to Zayd ibn Haritha and, and Ja'far and Abdullah, this, this, uh, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, the military command that now you were bargaining, you came to, to basically punish Shurahbil, which he may have five, ten thousand soldiers. Now you're gonna face two hundred thousand soldiers. You're gonna have an army that is it's not even an equation. 3,000, 200,000. So, Muslims started thinking, okay, now the mission, the mission has changed. This is, this is not what we are sent for. This is not what we are sent to do. We were not sent to fight Heraqal. We were not fight, sent to fight Caesar. We were sent to fight Shurahbil. What should we do? Should we send to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ask him for instruction? Should we go back to Medina and, and, and be prepared to defend Medina, our capital? 200,000 people may attack. Or should we just stay and fight? It's difficult options. And, and we would not probably consider the heaviness of what is going on unless you, you put yourself in that place. Now you were sent to do something and, and the mission is, is quadrupled and it's 10 to 20 folds as, as much. As it, as it was. So, Abdullah ibn Rawaha stood up. The man who was crying, leaving Medina. And they thought he was a coward or trying to love life. And he said, Ya qawmi wallahi inna lati takrahoon lalati kharajtum tatlubun. Those that you hate, the things that you are fearing, is the very same thing that you went out for. The shahada, the martyrdom. You went, what do you, what do you get out of your houses for? What did you get in this army for? It's to fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here's the fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't this what you get out, got out to do? Isn't that what you set out in your mind to do? And then martyr them in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, وَمَا نُقَاتِلُ النَّاسَ بِعَدَدٍ وَلَا قُوَّةٍ وَلَا كثرة. We do not fight people because of our numbers, or our strength, or our equipment. Start reminding them of all these battles. Every single battle Muslims were less than their enemy. He said, we don't fight people with our numbers. We don't fight them because we're better equipped. We don't fight them because we're stronger. We're always weaker in the face of our enemy, man to man. We only fight them with this faith, with this religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. And honor this with. فَانْطَلِقُوا Then go on and fight. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ إِحْدَى الْحُسْنَيَينَ There's only one of two good choices. One of two good things that will happen to you if you fight. إِمَّا ظُهُورًا وَإِمَّا شَهَادًا It's either victory or shahada. Or die death on the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after they heard that speech from Abdullah ibn Rawaha, people got uh, enticed and they got uh, stronger in their own minds and they all decided that they should go on and face that enormous army of 200,000 people. So this is the, these are the Sahaba, and these are the people that carried the banner of Islam early on. I mean, imagine that spirit. Now here, here, are, here they are without Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with them. Only 15, 20 years ago, or much, much less than that, like one of the people that was there was Khalid ibn al-Walid, and the, the, some others were only new Muslims. Only months, a, a year, that, that were raised and brought up by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spiritually, and see how strong they are. 
they are ready to face a, an army that is considered the superpower. Now we remember that the army of Byzantium defeated the army of Persia only a few years earlier and they were the absolute superpower of the known world at that time. And here are these 3,000 3, people coming out of the desert. They want to fight, they want to face the most powerful army on the face of the earth. Led by the emperor himself. Led by Caesar himself. What, what a situation and what a position. Subhanallah. Absolutely. This is the first time they're actually facing a conventional army force. Every uh, time they go, they face people like them. People that are used to not the professional army life. People that are used to invading and fighting and etc. But it's a, a, an amateur army in a way. But the army of Byzantium is an army. It's a professional army. It's a trained army. Army trained professionally to fight. And that was something that they don't know before. And then, in a place called Masharif, in a place that is south of Jordan, they uh, camped based on, on the uh, recommendations of their commanders. And then, when the enemy got close, they went into a smaller village, also in the south of Jordan, called Mu'ta. Mu'ta is the place where this battle got its name from. And they uh, started uh, organizing their army and just for uh, just academic purposes the, the leader of the right was Qutbah ibn Qatada and on the, on the left was Ubadah ibn Malik and they're from Al-Ansar, they're from the people of Medina. And then right there in Mu'tah, these 3,000 people, the 3,000 heroes of Islam were faced with the 200,000 strength army of Hiraql. And the first day of the battle, Zayd ibn Haritha, Zayd got the banner. He was the commander of that army. The love of Rasulullah, the beloved of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he, according to the historians, started fighting so ferociously, so sincerely, and he was immersed in the, in the heat of battle that they have not seen anybody fight like Zayd was fighting before. And then the spears started getting to him, the spears of, of the fighters of, of Byzantium, and he was starting getting one stab after the other, one wound after the other, and he fell. He fell, the banner was about to fall. And the second in command was Jafar. The cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At the end of the battle of Khaybar, Jafar just reached Khaybar. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I don't know which I'm happier with the coming of Jafar or the conquest of Khaybar. That was the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. He loved Jafar so much that seeing Jafar was, he didn't know whether to be more happy with the coming of Jafar or the victory that he achieved in Khaybar. This is how much... See Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the people he's sacrificing. This is the people he's losing. His, his beloved Zayd, his cousin Jafar. And then Jafar got the banner and he went on fighting. And he also fought so ferociously, so feverishly. He was fighting left and right and started fighting with his right hand until his right hand was cut off by the swords of the Roman. And then he took the sword with his left and the banner rolled home. And he still continued to, to fight until his left hand was cut as well, his left arm. So he, with his two shoulders, he held the banner. He held the banner so the banner of Islam would not fall. And the Muslim army would not sense that the banner falling means defeat. I mean, there is no leadership after that. So he continued to hold the banner with his shoulders and they started stabbing him everywhere. Every time where, where they reach him, they would stab him until a Roman cut him in half. The Roman hit him one, in one time and he cut him in half and he fell. And in Al-Bukhari, that Abdullah ibn Umar said that he saw Ja'far, Ja'far's body, after he fell. And he saw 
in his body, in the front of his body, not counting what cut in his back, 90 plus stabs on the front of his body. May Allah accept him and may Allah be pleased with him. So he was, this is how, how strong he was just standing there. I mean, wallahi, if somebody hits me with a stone, I would just fall with pain. Now he was standing there with 90 plus that they counted wounds on the rest, the remainder of his body. Now his arms are cut off and his body is ruined. And what if they can see, they saw 90 plus wounds on him. And this is an al-Bukhari. And in one of the narrations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced his arms with two wings in heaven, according to hadith. And now he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described that he's flying with his wings in paradise. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him as a martyr, and he was flying immediately in paradise with his wings. And the title that Ja'far carried from then on, if you hear of Imam Ja'far al-Tayyar, the flying Ja'far. This is how he is called, al-Tayyar, because of this event, because his arms were lost in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wings where he can fly in paradise as long as he wants, as much as he wants, whatever he wants, until the coming of the hour, until the day of the judgment. So he's flying in heaven as we speak, inshallah. And then after seeing this battered body of Ja'far and the battered body of Zayd, it's turn for Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Now, it's easy for us to sit here and say, okay, well, why don't you just take it, Ben or Abdullah, and just follow your, your brothers to paradise, follow them to Jannah. It's different when you see it. And, and we, we in our own selves, we love life. Death is not always easy. So Abdullah wanted to get the banner, and for a split second, he thought about it. This is a certain death. And then he started talking to himself, with the last few words of poetry that this great poet of Islam have ever uh, made, and he said, أَقْسَمْتِ يَا نَفْسُ لَتَنْزِلِنَّ كَارِهَةً أَوْ لَتُطَاوِعَنَّ إِنْ أَجْلَبَ النَّاسَ نَاسُ وَشَدُّ الرَّنَّ مَا لِي أَرَاكِ تَكْرَهِينَ الْجَنَّ He started talking to himself, he said, I swear upon you myself that you will take it. You will take it or I will force you to take it. Take the banner, take the, the sword and go on with the fighting. How come that you hate Jannah? He's talking to himself, he's trying to elevate his own morale, his own fighting morale. He said, how come that you hate Jannah, Abdullah? Isn't that what you were preaching to people only a few hours earlier, telling them that, come on, you cannot be cowards now, we have to go on. And then he took the banner and he went on to fighting and one of his cousins gave him a piece of meat. He said, Shudda bihada sulbak. Take, eat, take a few bites. So maybe you get strong for fighting. And then he took one bite. And then he threw it away. And then he took his sword. And he continued to fight and fight and fight as ferociously as the two heroes before him until he fell on the battleground and he was dead. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in Medina with his companions. And with the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was transmitting a direct live transmission to the people of Medina what is going on in Mu'ta. He was telling him, telling them, أَخَذَ الرَّايَةَ Zayd. Zayd carried the banner, فَأُصِيب. And he was killed. ثُمَّ أَخَذَ جَعْفَر. And then after him, Ja'far took the banner. فأصيب. And the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were tearing at that time. I mean, these are beloved people to his heart. And then he said, ثم أخذ ابن رواحة. And then ابن رواحة Abdullah took the banner. فأصيب. And he was killed. And then he said, ثم أخذ الراية سيف من سيوف الله. And then the banner went to a sword of Allah. To one of the swords of Allah. Now, Sahaba did not know who is he talking about. And here's what happened. 
a man of the people of Ajlan that was in a battle, his name was Thabit ibn Arqam, picked up the banner before it fell from Abdullah ibn Rawah. And he said, Ya Mashara Muslimin, astalihu ala rajulin minkum. Tell me, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam named only three people to carry the banner. Now, all three are martyred. All three are dead. He said, O Muslims, call upon one of you to come and take the banner, take the leadership. The army has no commander now. And they said, and you, you, you become, it's in your, it's in your hand. He said, no. <laughs> No, that's not my position. That's who is Thabit? He said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not qualified to lead the army. They looked around them. Who is the, a good fighter? Who is somebody that has the intelligence, the military experience to, to, to do something in this, in this major battle? And they looked around them and they saw the man that led the army of Mushrik against them in the battle of Uhud. They saw Khalid ibn al-Walid. And they said, Khalid. Khalid is the one that should lead us. He is the most expert fighter in the army. He is the one that has the military intelligence to take on and fight with the battle. And then Khalid agreed to take the banner and he continued to fight. And fight... To Khalid is a very serious manner. We said that there's only two people among Muslims in Nahal Arabia that can fight in both hands, both arms equally. And those are Khalid ibn al-Walid and Zubair ibn al-Awwam. So Khalid took his swords and he started fighting. And one sword would break. I mean, swords to break, that's for as much of a ferocious fighting as you can ever imagine. And then in Al-Bukhari, in Sahih Al-Bukhari, Khalid describes, he said, لَقَدْ قَطَعَتْ فِي يَدِي يَوْمَ مُؤْتَتَ تِسْعَةُ أَسْيَاءُ Nine swords he broke fighting on the day of Mu'tah. He was just going inside, in the middle and out, and fighting right and left, killing and, and, and defending his companions. And then he said, مَا بَقِيَ بِي فِي يَدِي إِلَّا صَحِيفَ يَمَانِيَّةِ and, and the only thing that could stand me, that could stand my fighting, was a Yemeni sword. The, the swords that were made in Yemen were very known because they usually come from Persia. Because Yemen was a Persian colony at that time. And they said, only a Yemeni sword that, that could stand in my hand the entire day. And, and this narrated, this uh, hadith is narrated twice upon Khalid. And Khalid continued to fight and defend all day until sunset. Both armies were tired. And usually in, in warfare, in the old uh, days, in the ancient times, they would stop at night. Okay, there is no infrared sensors and, and there's nothing, you know, directed to others. So they would have to stop at night. And they stopped. The Muslims were tired but not defeated. These 3,000 that faced a 200,000 army, they should not last an hour, much less the whole day, and not be defeated at the end of the day. This is how much fighting they put up. The army of the Romans were surprised, astonished, that what is going on here? There is only, this is not even one half a brigade in, in our army. How come they're still here? How come we're going to do it again tomorrow? So they were shaken morally, the, the, the Byzantine army. And Khalid started using his military intelligence, preparing his army for the second day of battle. The second day of the battle of Mu'tah. What he did, as we said, the army of, of warfare at that time would go on into five sections. One on the right, one on the left, the front, the heart, and the back. Okay. Usually the leadership is in the heart, and fighting goes on on all four directions. So the people that fight the right are the left side of the Roman army, and they come fight the right side of the Muslim army, and, and vice versa. And the back is to protect the army and, and help with the relief. So what he did at night, is he starts switching people. He took the people that were fighting on the right and he took them to the left. And then he took the people that were fighting on the left and took them to the right. And he took the people that were fighting in the back and put them in the front. And took the people that were fighting in the front and put them in the back. And then 
he started getting ready to fight the next day. And as the break of dawn and the Roman and the Byzantine army started seeing, waiting for the people to fight, they looked and they saw new faces. Now the Roman army did not switch positions. So the ones that were fighting the right of the Muslim army, they saw whole new people. Everybody is completely new and and they didn't see any of the people they were fighting the day before. So the same thing on the left. Everything has changed. And they thought, oh, they got the supplies at night. They got the help. <laughs> there's, well, there's 3,000 that we were fighting that we couldn't defeat. There, there are more now. <laughs> there, there are a new, uh, new, new army coming. So that also shook them. And they started fighting as ferociously and as fervently, as, as severely as the day before. And then Khalid started doing one of the deception plans that is known in military history, that's actually been been taught in military academies, because brothers, and a defeated army, an army that is withdrawing, those who know anything about military, they know the, the withdrawing army is the one that really gets the heaviest losses. It, to withdraw an army from the battlefield, that's during withdrawal, is when you get your heaviest losses. There is not an army that can withdraw without major losses in life and equipment. And what Khalid did, the plan of deception that he did, he's the, one of the few armies, if not the only in history, that withdraw from a battlefield without losing a man, without losing a fighter. What he did is he would retreat a little bit and stop and continue to fight. And then retreat back a little bit and stop and continue to fight forward. And then draw back a little bit further. And then the Muslim, and then as the Muslims were doing this and retreating little by little south, the Byzantine command is looking at the battlefield and they saw their armies are advancing more towards the desert. They're getting more south. I said, wait a minute. They're trying to get us into an ambush. The Muslim army is trying to take us away into the desert where more fighters are waiting for us. Now they think that they, the Muslim army is getting supplies and the Muslim army has got new fighters everywhere. And they said, well, they're trying to attract us and they're trying to trick us into following them way down into the desert where they know the desert very well and we don't. And there is an ambush must be waiting for us down there. So they let them retreat. They, the, the, commander, the, the, the commanders of the, of the Byzantine army they did not follow Muslims as they retreated after a while. And Adnan Khalid continued to retreat back, retreat back with his army until he pulled out of Mu'ta, pulled out of that area, and then went down to Hijaz and ready to fight if any uh, Roman army is following uh, the Muslim army. And the Romans, what they did is they said, okay, now we put the danger back. Muslims are retreating. We will not follow them. And they were totally shaken morally by the ferociousness and the strength of the Muslim armies fighting. And they did not know what is waiting for them. That is strategically extremely important, brothers. Had Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not send an army to face that, or if the Muslim army, after they got there, they decided to, to fear the fight of the 200,000, then the entire Arabia will be wide open for a Roman invasion. Then the, the Roman, the Byzantine army would, would go on and follow that army that refused to fight all the way to Medina. And that's what they want to do. They want to just finish this whole thing, this whole Islam off. And the fight, the, the, the strength and the braveness of the fighters of Murta is what made the entire Byzantine plan change and they retreated back to Damascus and then retreated back to their bases. And as the Muslims uh, started coming back to Medina, Muslims were never withdrawn from any battle before. So people of Medina were furious with this army. They did not receive this army as heroes. They received them as people who pulled out of the battlefield. They said, it's better for you to be killed, all of you. What are you doing here? How come you retreated? How come you are defeated? How come you, you came? Number one, they were not defeated. 
the, they retreated, which is a total difference. So you don't count this as a defeat. On the contrary, the the the. Do you know how many Muslims were lost in this battle of Mu'tah? 3,000 against 200,000? 12. And in some narration probably you're right, 14. And in, in, in the one I read it was 4, 12. But I mean less than 20? Less than 100? Less than 1,000? This is, um, this is a miracle. This is support for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know how many Roman? This, they were countless. They did not have a count, head count of how many. They lost many hundreds of people. And that fight. So as far as losses, there was it was no comparison between the two between the two armies. So as the Muslim army was coming into Medina, the children and the people were throwing stones at them. Ya furrar, oh you escapee, you 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 defeated, you you are run you runaways from the battlefield. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, no, no. Mahum bil furrar. They are not the retreaters. They are not the defeated. They are not the runaways. Innahum al kurrar. They are the ones that will go back and fight. It's just a military, military tactic. What happened? And he said, and there was the, that verse that Allah subhanahu wa taala said that you cannot escape. You cannot turn your back on your enemy. And the Muslims were said, well, they turned their back. They escaped the battlefield. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you cannot escape the battlefield except if you want to go into uh, as the verse goes. Unless you are going into a different team, into a different situation, into a different army. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أنا فئة كل مسلم. I am the team of every Muslim. I am the place that every Muslim should come to. So when these people came back to me, they were not escaping. They did not leave me. In, word, in, in other words, they did not escape Islam. They did not leave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and run away to, to Najd. They came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They retreated well. They fought well. They defended the position of the army. And they came to their commander, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for more action. For what is next? We're with you. We're, gonna, we're ready to fight. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّهُمُ الْكُرَّارِ they're the ones that will fight back. And who is the one? Who is the leader that conquered Rome? That conquered the Byzantine Empire in the Battle of Yarmouk? And he conquered the cities of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Halab. Khalid ibn al-Walid. And the prophecy of Rasulullah came true. Innahum al kurrar They're the ones that will go back. And that's what happened. Khalid came back and went all the way to northern Syria. And he conquered that whole land for the Muslim Ummah. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called upon Khalid and he said, وَمَا خَالِدٌ إِلَّا سَيْفٌ مِنْ سِيُوفِ اللَّهِ And Khalid, but only a sword of the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What the, the effect, the results of the battle of Murta that we will conclude with inshallah tonight. Muslims did not retaliate, they did not defeat Shurahbil, the man that killed the ambassador of Rasulullah wasallam, because they were faced with this enormous army. But the reputation of Muslims was completely saved in Arabia. Now every Arab tribe including the people of Ghassan, those who killed the ambassador. They were, they were daring enough to kill the messenger of Rasulullah thinking that they have the support of Caesar, that the whole Byzantine Empire will come to their aid, and they did. And they said, well, we can do whatever we want with the messengers of the Prophet But when they saw what happened in the Battle of Mu'tah, they were very shaken. They think, well, if Caesar himself and his commanders, and his army. They could not defeat only 3,000 of the followers of Muhammad. Then can we try to invade Medina? Can we even think about attacking Muslims in their own houses, in their own land? So the reputation of Muslims was saved in that battle. And then standing steadfast in front of the most powerful army on the face of the earth, the superpower of that time meant a lot to Muslims. They gave them the self-confidence and increased their faith 
and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, their, as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, their protector and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has the victory and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives victory to whomever he pleases 12 people lost in this ferocious battle now this ferocious battle should annihilate the entire army that, that went out to Mu'tah and then they incre- that increased their belief in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the prophecies that he said and then what he told them about the army and, and his position and his treatment for the retreated army and that increased the love of Muslims to their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then most importantly this battle started the face off between Muslims and the Byzantine Empire that did not end until the days of Muhammad the conqueror of the Ottoman uh, dynasty who uh, conquered uh, what was known then as Constantinople and then it was known as Istanbul which is the capital of Turkey which is one of the most beautiful most important Muslim cities on the face of the earth today and changed that from uh, a, a Christian and just open the, the floor for any questions or comments you may have. We finished with the Battle of Mu'tah. And inshallah, we will go on and uh, in the next session speak of one of the most important milestones in the history of Islam. And that is the conquest of Mecca. Fathu Mecca. And inshallah, uh, we will try to uh, do some audiovisual uh, aids with the battle so we will see with the branches of the Muslim how they moved into Mecca, how they got into Mecca and uh, one difference there will be inshallah that we will change the day that we do our session and our study during the month of Ramadan and it will be on Saturday inshallah and it will be after the potluck dinner that usually takes place in this mosque so inshallah the activities uh, after potluck dinner, we'll be more than chatting and uh, and uh, enjoying the food. We will enjoy each other's company, and we will have a short presentation about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Just one reminder for uh, you brothers, just to remind your other brothers to control their children during the session and to help us uh, fulfill our siyam and fulfill our worship in Ramadan in a good way. Ramadan, as we know, is is a boot camp. Uh, for the Muslim soul is the play is is the training camp where we go into every year to rejuvenate to renew our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I know f- just by myself that I am in, in desperate need for that every year and uh, inshallah we will help each other and support each other into doing more in Ramadan and into living the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as much as possible during the month of Ramadan with all his sunnah and to relive his seerah in our behavior and our life. So if anybody has a comment about this uh, beautiful uh, seerah, beautiful seera or beautiful uh, sariyah of Mu'tah or the battle of Mu'tah, please uh, feel free. This is not a, a one-man show. This is an interaction uh, between all of us. We, we all study this together. Yes, Brother Mufti. Brother Mufti is telling me that Hamza also was known to do that. It's, it's the way of fighting is to use both Swords, so uh, I was not aware of that. Jazakallah khair. Uh, also read that uh, in addition to switching uh, the army. Jazakallah khair, yes. And, that, and I also read that that happened in the Battle of Yarmouk yeah. as well. Is, is, uh, so more narration said that it happened then. Uh, and, and he startled the, the entire Byzantine army. And in the Battle of Yarmouk, they were defeated badly. Well, and, and they were shaken. They have to get the banner. They're on a horse. They they fasten the banner with their horse or whatever. Allahu alam how they did it. But I mean they 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 continue on fighting and they direct uh, the army through the banner movement and they continue. And this is a very difficult job, very difficult position to be. Right. Usually it's in the heart, but again, in the heat of battle, those those brigades, they sp- branches, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, they don't stay, you know, well defined. I mean, they penetrate. The Muslim army, I mean, it's it was, uh, you know, during the description of the battle, like like uh, those like uh, Zayd ibn Haritha would penetrate right deep into the the army of the Byzantine, Byzantine, and the same thing happens 
for the for the Byzantine people. Yeah. Yeah, there is no uniform. I mean, you know, they, they know, like, you know, I'm wearing a green shirt and you're wearing a white. I mean, they, they, and you've been, we've been, we fought each other all day and we're at it all day and they, they just, they, rec- they don't recognize any faces in the whole thing. The leaders, I mean, even if they don't recognize anything, they will at least recognize the leaders. Yeah, and, and there's nothing to, everything is new. <laughs> this is a whole new team that came over and that start, that perplexed them, that, that confused them, the Roman, the Roman army. The uh, 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 all that mud on the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, not to say that any of that is true in any way, just to, yeah. right. But, but that's how they attack the, our religion and, and our, and they always go over the, the propaganda that Islam was spread by the sword and Islam is the violent religion and Islam is a religion of hate and etc. etc. There was just an article, I think, in today's commercial appeal by Carl Thomas trying to link that uh, a guy, Joe Allen Muhammad, uh, to the Muslims in general, although he is not a Muslim by our you know, recognition. He's from the nation of Islam, which are not recognized by Muslims as uh, Muslims in any way, as mainstream Muslims to begin with. And right, he attacks Muslims in general and, and et cetera, et cetera. Not to dwell over the, the, the article itself, but that's what we face. Well, we look at the history and we look at what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does and how he, how he commands and how he conducts uh, the army and the fighting. It's so humane. And in Iran in a time, and I'm just reiterating what Brother Mufti is saying, Dr. Rathmani said that there is no international laws. There is no United Nations. There is no humanitarian uh, organizations. It is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the law of God that the prophet of God is bringing to mankind. And that's how to conduct war. And this was not recognized by any armies that the Muslims themselves were fighting. I mean, if you think about what would happen if it was the other way around, if the, the non-Muslim army was victorious in any of these battles, now there's a guarantee that will be a total annihilation of the Muslims. Sparing none. And that's the way where warfare was in those days. Right. So, uh, I think that although we know that the Bible, right. look here, this is what you have in your Bible. Right. In fact, we have to take the offensive and tell yeah. you the defensive. Right. Right. Abu Tamar, you had a comment? Or? It's the upper arm. So he grabbed it like that. They cut the arm. Excuse me. He cut the arm, so he grabbed it with, with his shoulder like that. He was just holding it to his body and just keeping it up while he was getting stabbed everywhere. And that's how they counted nine. The time of Syria, the time this, of course, warfare changes. And the way warfare conducts Muslims uh, go on with, with the moderation of warfare. I mean, that obviously changed later on. But the way it, warfare was at that time for in Arabia, I mean, Caesar will not hold the banner for the Byzantine army. It's, it's a whole different situation. But the, the way warfare was in Arabia, in Hijaz at that time, was that. Was whoever gets the banner gets to command the army. Was Because you tilt the banner right, that means everybody swing to the right. You tilt the banner left, the army go to the left. That's how you command them. There is no, uh, you know, uh, wireless communication and, and uh, noise of the battle. So they had a visual... Uh, command, which is the banner. So you know if, if the banner is heading to the mountain of Uhud, that you should follow. You should try to go on and, and go in there and, and, and stay with your people. So that's how they commanded the army. Yeah, as far as the Battle of Mut, that's actually documented. The, the question is, what color was the banner? It was white at that time. It was a white banner, so was the, the, the Battle of Uhud, so was the Battle of Badr. So as many of the battles at that time, it was mostly white banner till that time. And most of the banners that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used himself were all white. White banners. Mean That doesn't mean surrender. <laughs> I don't think there was any writing on him that is documented. Now later on, you know, People started writing La ilaha illallah. We know the, the, for example, the banners of the Abbasis were all black. The banners of uh, Omar were, were green. 
the banners of the people of Umayyah, if I'm not mistaken, were mostly red. But, uh, but the banner color does not reflect any particular uh, change. Now, the color that mostly used to recognize Islam nowadays was green. And it's not really narrated that the banners of Rasulullah were mostly green, were all mostly, mostly white. Uthman? Why? Okay, so if we have no more comments or questions, uh, may Allah reward you for being such uh, good listeners and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, help us all again uh, continue on the study of seerah and most importantly learn the lessons of seerah, apply it to our lives. Uh, Brother uh, Osmani suggested a beautiful suggestion the last time that we should also have more sessions to outline the manners, the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only uh, for this to become a historical narration of the events and the battles and the military actions and the tactics of Muslims at that time, although this is important for us to understand. As you see, we draw from that a lot of lessons as well about the behaviors of Muslims, their, their steadfastness, and etc. But still, we need to go over the study of the manners, the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, other things that are not related to historical events, related things that are related to social events in the Muslim Ummah. And inshallah ta'ala we will try to put more light on that uh, in the future. Uh, next session we're still going with the historical uh, draw and, and the draft of the of the flow and go with the banner of we'll go with the with the uh, Fatah Mecca inshallah with the conquest of Mecca. And during Ramadan, we may have shorter sessions, maybe about 45 minutes or so, because uh, we definitely have to stop for Taraweeh and, and Isha prayer and all. I think uh, people usually finish eating probably by then, and we'll just you know, probably do 6.30 to 7.30 and leave about 30 minutes or a little bit more for, for preparation. جزاكم الله خير اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما بفقه وفقه في الدين يا أرحم الراحمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين